turned author and having 38 patents based in California. And he is the man behind P Guru, the famous website. Uh, we thank our viewers for your support, which we have been getting. Our 12th December issue, which was the last uh, episode we had on our channel, was on the latest development on India China relations, where journalist Anand Krishnan was present and they discussed it with Dr. Swami. And our viewership for this program has crossed 61,000 viewers across various channels. As you all know, we are very, we are available on various social media platform, podcast, and other social media uh, channels. So we thank our viewers across the globe for the support they have been giving us for our viewership and for the views which we express in our program. I have to thank my co-host, uh, Professor Arvind Chaturvedi from Delhi, and my, my friend Ramesh Swami for their support. And I also have to thank, thank our technical team led by Ashish Shetty, Tejas Navalgul, Gadgi Rakesh, Ishwar Iyer, Swami Nathan, Vishal Mehta, and Ajesh Nair for the background support for putting this program together. So with these words, it's over to Dr. Subramanian Swami to initiate the discussion on today's important topic, Quad versus BRICS, where does India stand? Thank you. Dhaniyavad. Thank you, Jagdish. Thank you, Jagdish. Uh, and uh, welcome to uh, all the participants. Uh, <clears throat> my job will be to give a background because there are a lot of people who have seen these uh, uh, pneumonyms as they are called or whatever these uh, brief words like uh, quad and breaks and they want to know what it's, uh, how it came to be uh, and what is the background. So I'll give the background today uh, before uh, asking uh, Nalapath and uh, uh, Sri Ayer uh, to, uh, to give us and then of course the panel that is here we'll all discuss together. First of all I'd like to say that BRICS uh, was formed uh, as BRIC because there were only four countries to begin with uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, that was in 2006. And uh, then in 2010, South Africa also joined, so it's now called BRICS. And uh, essentially, the core uh, objective of BRICS, as stated, is economic cooperation and policies to dominate global growth, how to integrate ourselves together and uh, 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 you know, uh, dominate global growth and take over the entire Western world uh, in the economy by 2050. This is how uh, it, it started. And the first uh, summit meeting formally took place on June 16, 2010, uh, excuse me, 2009. And of course, from our side, uh, Manmohan Singh uh, participated. Now, uh, if you look at the enormity of BRICS, it's 41% 40, uh, of the total world's population it represents. Of course, India and China make 36, 37%, uh, but uh, still together they constitute uh, 41%. And uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, you will find that uh, India and China together constitute 24% of the world's GDP. 16% of the world trade and 29.3% uh, of the total geographical area of the world. So uh, this is a very substantial group in terms of uh, the numbers. The question is how they're going to function, uh, how they have functioned and how they will function in the future. That's the key thing that, uh, that will be considered. Now, Quad was formed in 2007. Uh, remember that BRICS was founded in 2006. And Quad was formed in 2007 as US, India, Japan, and Australia, these four. And uh, the, uh, after the general elections in, uh, in Australia, pro-Chinese, uh, as is popularly called, uh, alleged, I don't know if it's true or not, 
in 2008, Australia withdrew. And then after another general election, uh, the Australians returned again. So I, I, Australians uh, are back in, in quad. So it's a quad, it's four, four countries, uh, US, India, Japan, and Australia. Now in 2012, uh, the Japanese prime minister uh, was became a little more ambitious and he wanted this to be called the democratic security diamond. He really basically felt that Quad should be a force for fighting undemocratic countries. And therefore, uh, uh, with this uh, in mind, uh, a meeting took place in 2017 in the Philippines, but except the fact that the objectives of of um, uh, Quad uh, was not purely economic as uh, the BRICS is, but it also included military aspects, uh, securing sea lanes. Of course, they said there is for the commercial traffic, but then you have to use military force, uh, a military force for this purpose. And so therefore the military has to be involved. Then, uh, the focus of, of, uh, of Quad or throughout in its idiom has been anti-Chinese. And the interesting part is China also is uh, vociferously against the Quad. And it is, uh, uh, it, it has pointed out that uh, Bangladesh, which wanted to join Quad was not allowed because it was considered too close to China uh, by uh, some countries in the Quad. So therefore, uh, Quad formulated uh, four uh, particular objectives. First objective was a rule-based global order. That is an orderly thing where everybody follows the same rules. Uh, it's an um, ambitious uh, goal, but it's a worthwhile goal. Freedom of navigation, especially for commercial traffic. And a liberal trading regime where uh, all these uh, uh, barriers to trade and all and uh, export import uh, is removed. So in that context, we have to see um, what, which is of these two is going to succeed because they're clearly uh, not uh, working from on, on the same plane. Now, there's one problem, the BRICS. Uh, the First of all, it's uh, overly dominated by just two countries, India and China, population-wise. But economically, China is far ahead, as of now, uh, of the other uh, BRICS countries. And therefore, the room for uh, trade of China with these countries where China exports uh, manufacturing products, but also imports uh, manufactured products so that, you know, both countries benefit. And not like today, for example, India, uh, most of China uh, are manufactured goods and bulk of India's exports to China is raw material. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, the uh, the metals that are dug up, uh, um, then uh, jewels, and so many other, these raw um, uh, I, I, uh, things which can be processed in China and exported elsewhere. So we find most of the trade that uh, China is having to other countries is to sell its uh, manufacturing products and, uh, and receive in uh, return uh, the uh, raw, uh, raw materials which are needed for the manufacture of this. So it's a, it's a country unless there is a physical or a mental domination of China. I don't think that uh, even with India there, BRICS uh, is going to have a smooth sailing. It's going to be a rickety uh, thing. And I would say that um, India would perhaps be the most uh, difficult position because it has to choose. No other country has to choose. Uh, the, the, uh, Brazil doesn't have to choose. Uh, South Africa doesn't have to choose. Um, but India has to choose either 
uh, uh, bricks or quad. And so that's what the topic today is. Where should India be? And we have got two people who are uh, um, experts, uh, knowledgeable, uh, independent minded. And so I think we can begin the uh, discussion uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with this. Can India survive in BRICS with a dominant China? Two. Can India be called, you know, uh, you know, be a force for democracy in the company of BRICS? Uh, will Quad mean India will have to participate in military issues of Japan and Australia, and leave alone the United States, or that uh, it will be only uh, a way to guide the United Nations? So these are some of the big issues arising for India. What do we have to, what would we choose? Because it's not going to be easy to continue very much longer in both places. And uh, the, the Chinese rhetoric getting more and more extreme and the fact that the Chinese have uh, come into our territory in a big way, I think uh, we have to make a choice. And what should be the choice? Over to Mr. Nalapat and then to uh, our uh, friend uh, Shri Ayer. Okay, well, Dr. Mr. Nalapat, Professor Nalapat, please yes. enlighten us on what you think. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I think you have enlightened us sufficiently about both <laughs> these uh, uh, organizations, and uh, I don't think anybody can improve upon that. Uh, I'd only like to point out that you know you have the UN Security Council. Now, the assumption behind the United Nations uh, Bretton Woods system was that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was, uh, was around during that time. Roosevelt was an individual who believed that you could uh, bring Russia and the United States together. And he worked comfortably with Russia during the war. Uh, in fact, America made a significant <laughs> contribution to winning the war by providing Russia with a huge amount of armaments and other assistance. But... Uh, Soon after that, you had the Cold War. Uh, you had the Cold Warriors, uh, you know, on, on both sides. There was a fear that Stalin would not be satisfied with Eastern Europe. He would try and expand into Western Europe. And more importantly, across Africa, South America, parts of Asia, uh, Stalin was supporting the local communist parties. So the Cold War began. And the UN Security Council, the five members there, were in effect split. You had, uh, you had on the one hand, Russia, uh, and on the other hand, you had the other four countries because in the 1970s, effectively, China was on the side of the United States, France, and Britain against Russia. So the Russia was alone, but they had the veto. So, the, so you had that split between Russia on the one hand and the other four countries on the other. Now, uh, so far as BRICS is concerned, well, when the uh, Goldman Sachs uh, chap, uh, in, you know, in, uh, came up with this concept of BRIC, and uh, I think if you recall, there was a, an, an op-ed in the, in the China Daily, and that op-ed said, why don't we bring South Africa into the Quad as well? I mean, into the BRICS as well. Now, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm not going to name the person who wrote that particular op-ed, but possibly, Dr. Swami, you and others in, in this particular show know him very well. Anyway, South, Af South Africa was made a member because you can't keep the African continent out of BRICS and therefore it became from brick into bricks, as you very correctly said. The reality is today that there are now, there is a cleavage in BRICS. You have China on the one hand, you have Russia, whether by default, mostly by default, with China. And then you have India, South Africa, and Brazil. Frankly, on one side. Now, Brazil is not, you know, in a sense, fronting the uh, Indo-Pacific, but Brazil is definitely not on the side of, uh, of China, nor is it on the side of Russia. It's much more on the side of India. And South Africa also has got a very strong personal interest in a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Rather than Indo-Pacific that is dominated by single power, a free, open, 
inclusive Indo-Pacific is very important to South Africa. And may I say Brazil as well. So you have these three countries. You have South Africa, India, and Brazil. And on the other hand, you have Russia and China. Now, what is happening now? You know, in the UN Security Council, for some time, America was ascendant. Russia was really, uh, you know, after 1991, 19, Russia was, the Soviet Union was finished. So for about 12 to 15 years, Americans really ran the show uh, in, in the UNSC. Yeltsin found it very difficult to stand up against the United States. He hardly did so. It's only when Putin came at the close of the last century that Russia, after some time, began to realize that it had to basically take a strong stand. Uh, so the reality of situation is, frankly, that you know, in the UN Security Council, for some time you had untrammeled American power. You know, untrammeled. No other country could challenge America. The Chinese were with the Americans, and the Chinese were with the Americans for very good reasons. They wanted to develop their own country, and the best way was tagging on to, to the Americans, and the Americans, the Taiwanese, and the Japanese, all of whom are now in the, the targets of China, of uh, Xi Jinping, all three are the countries that did the most to make China what it is today. Of course, the wise diplomacy of Dr. Swami's friend, uh, Deng Xiaoping, was also very much responsible for that. There's no question about it. Deng was a genius uh, in geopolitics. I mean, I don't think he would have consented to be a professor, but I'd like to say that he was a brilliant geopolitical expert. And you have to be a geopolitical uh, uh, expert if you want to run a country the size of China or India or Brazil or Russia or the United States effectively. You have to understand the currents and cross currents of geopolitics. So what I want to say is that in BRICS, the initial assumption was India is going to rise very fast. Uh, Russia is going to is rising very fast. Remember, oil prices were shooting up during that time. China was definitely you know, uh, rising very fast. And uh, as a consequence, in BRIC, uh, what happened was all four countries were doing pretty well. China, of course, had a head start because it, it started its rise by the early 80s. India, after, uh, after again, Dr. Swami's close friend, P.V. Narasimha Rao, took over. And that was uh, you know, back in 1992. But India also was doing pretty well. Uh, in the, but over the last, I would say, decade or so, we see that Russia is not doing too well economically at least. Brazil is not doing too well, not doing well at all. India also, uh, because of various factors, India also, that early glow of significant economic progress is not there. And at the meantime, China, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, uh, Hu Jintao, China has been racing ahead. Uh, recently, it's faced some speed bumps caused by, uh, largely because of its own approach in the new era. But the reality is China is today head and shoulders above any of the other three uh, uh, I mean, four, four, you know, partners of, of BRICS. And, and, and may I say, oh, the, uh, the other four partners of BRICS, and it is they're, they're bigger, if I may say so as an economy, than all the other four partners combined by far. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the situation. I mean, you know, you call it BRICS. It should be CCCC and then BR, <laughs> BRS or something, you know, because uh, it is dominated by China. Uh, much more than the United States dominated the UNSC, China is today dominating BRICS. Now, what does that mean? During the time when the US was dominating, uh, you know, the UNSC, Narasimha Rao tried very hard to become friendly with the United States. And frankly, you know, uh, Bill Clinton was not the smartest man on the planet, except where getting himself elected and re-elected was concerned. He was very good on that. And he knew what policies to follow to make sure the majority of the American people supported him. But Bill Clinton did two cardinal mistakes. One, Russia wanted to enter into the zone of influence of the United States the zone of influence that included Western Europe. 
and Gorbachev has started this thing about a common European home. Uh, Yeltsin also talked about a common European home. And may I say, for the first four to six years of his rule, Putin also started talking about a common European home, uh, except when he realized that the Europeans did not want him in a home. They wanted him, frankly, in a pit, because they wanted Russia to be a pastoral country. No technology, nothing. When he realized that, of course, he forgot about the common European uh, home and turned to Eurasia. And Russia is the quintessential Eurasian power. I've always said, Russia is neither European nor is Asian. It's Eurasian. And of course, Dr. Swami and Sri Ayer, in a, in a sense, we are all Eurasians. You know, we are all Eurasians uh, now, especially. But I want to say that given this situation, BRICS is today dominated by a single country, which is China. Now, the point about China, China learns very fast how to do something which another country has perfected. Uh, Sri Ayer would have, you know, I mean, knows that extremely well. He's tracked that technology sphere, how China used to buy up American tech companies. And then the Chinese companies would, the, the tech would be completely taken away. And the Chinese would then come forward with their own tech, which was as good as the American company that they had taken over. And that American company will, will frankly be thrown by the roadside. Its people will be, you know, its workers will be thrown away. So the reality of the situation is Bill Clinton said, no, Russia cannot join. And he wanted to continue with the pastoralization of Russia. And India, he wanted India. He said, you know, you're a third world power. I mean, I wrote an, uh, an op-ed in Times of India in the early 90s, the thumb of e Ekalavya. And I said, India is Ekalavya. We learned the hard way how to become a nuclear and and missile power. And Ekalavia cut off his thumb. In my view, Ekalavia ought not to have done that. He should have cut off the thumb of the individual who told him to cut off his thumb. But he was too <laughs> civilized to do that. But having learned from Ekalavia's mistake, I said, we, act, we cannot be the Ekalavia. We cannot cut off our nuclear thumb. We cannot cut off our missile uh, you know, fingers. We can't do that. Just because Bill Clinton says, we are not going to welcome you. You know, you're going to welcome us without a thumb, without fingers, when we are pleading on the ground? What kind of a welcome is that? So the fact is, Bill, and, and don't forget Dr. Swami, it, and, uh, and my good, dear friend Sri, it was during Bill Clinton's eight years in office that both Wahhabism and China grew by leaps and bounds. 9-11, the seeds of 9-11 was sown by Clinton's decision in 1996 to bring the Taliban to power on a red carpet. It is Bill Clinton, the American president. Forget the Pakistanis. Pakistanis have always been hired hands of people. They have never had a mind of their own. They essentially are, uh, you know, are for hire, for rent, the Pakistan military, not the Pakistan people, the Pakistan military. So, you know, so the reality situation is that under Clinton, India also was rebuffed. Narasimha Rao faced intense pressure on Kashmir. The, there was a very strong insurgency. It was supported by China. It was supported by the United States. Who can forget that uh, Assistant Secretary of State Robin Rafael going there and trying to create more and more trouble, more and more violence against India in an open fashion. She didn't hide it. And she had the full support of Bill Clinton. Uh, Clinton completely backed her. So you had China, you had the United States, uh, and a very weak Russia that frankly was not could not help you as it helped in the past. But Narasimha Rao navigated this in a very skillful manner. And those of us who had the privilege of knowing him, uh, Dr. Swami has had that privilege. To a much lesser extent, I have had that privilege. We admired the way he steered India through that difficult Clinton period. Until finally, even Clinton realized that you've got to deal with India. And he finally made a visit to India in the very last months, in the very last year of his uh, eight years in power. And of course, the, the you know, in India, uh, somehow in the lutein zone, the more you damage India, the more you hurt India, the more welcome you are. So he got a tremendous welcome in India. 
even though he was one of, in my view, one of the most anti-Indian presidents in the United States. What I want to say, Dr. Swami and Sri Ayer, is now very simple. So far as BRICS is concerned, let us admit the fact it's a Chinese construct. <laughs> Effectively, it's a Chinese construct. China will not allow BRICS uh, to do anything beyond serve its own geopolitical interest. Now, we may, you know, uh, claim that no, 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 you know, we have, I mean, we are, we are equally, we are strong. We have 1.4 billion people. Yes, but the, I'm, I'm afraid their economy is five times more. And unfortunately, in this world, it's the economy that counts. I mean, Bill Clinton said, it's the economy is stupid. I'm not going to use any adjective, but I would like to say it's the economy that counts. So let's be honest. We are not going to get much of a diplomatic dividend from BRICS. But at the same time, let's keep on it because geopolitics is a fluctuating science. It's a fluctuating situation. It's a fluctuating equilibrium. And possibly a time may come in which Russia perhaps may, uh, may realize it's, it's, uh, you know, the future path lies with, in, with India rather than with, with China. And the Americans and the Europeans will be smart enough to understand that Russia is a force multiplier to the greatest threat they are facing, an existential threat, which is China. That may happen. Definitely South Africa and Brazil will be there. So possibly that time will come. So frankly, I am not in favor of leaving BRICS, but I would like to say a very strong reality check. If any person in India, official India, or non-official India thinks BRICS is going to be of any value to India. So long as China is as dominant in BRICS as it is today, well, forget about it. It's like the UN Security Council. In effect, India has the same position there, let's say, as Botswana or Lesotho or something. You may get Botswana elected to the UN Security Council. You may get Lesotho. But in terms of law, we are a non we are one of the many members of the General Assembly. We are not among the permanent five in the UNSC. And frankly, I think it is, it is frankly a reflection on the UN, not on India. That a country of 1.4 billion intensely talented people as yet has not become part of the USC. And we will never become part of the UNSC so long as China remains under President Xi Jinping. I can tell you that very clearly. Any effort that we make to try and join the UNSC as a permanent member, very, very frankly, so long as Xi Jinping is, is president of, is the general secretary of the party, and he is now general secretary for life, it's a waste of diplomatic effort. Like it's a waste of diplomatic effort to be thinking that BRICS will be of any value to India. We have to put all our efforts into ensuring that BRICS does not harm India in the way the Chinese want every single institution. When I say Chinese, I mean the Chinese Communist Party led by the current crop of leaders. I don't mean China. I don't mean even the Communist Party. They've done a lot of good for China. Deng did that, definitely. And it has, and, and you know, both Jiang and Hu carried that forward. But definitely I would like to say my expectation of BRICS and the UNSC is extremely low, extremely low. At the same time, should we walk out? No, we should remain because in a dynamic situation, if the right policies are followed, very, very frankly, if the right tactics are followed, well, we can leapfrog in this, you know, in this 2021, 2031, the way China leapfrog 1981 to 1991. Okay, thank you, uh, President Alpat. You've thrown in many ideas. Uh, we'll get back to it after hearing uh, Sri Ayer. Uh, but uh, before I ha hand it over to Sri Ayer, let me uh, pose one point to you. Uh, <clears throat> you uh, uh, as far as BRICS is concerned, you made a very strong case. So why, you know, we are not going to get anything much out of it. Uh, but you said you should continue nevertheless being a member of BRICS. Um, then uh, on the question of uh, Quad, 
the other three members, they are all connected to each other by military alliance. Japan is a military ally of uh, China, of the United States. So is Australia. And so India is the only country there which has no formal alliance, military alliance with, uh, with the United States. So why not think of, uh, instead of being in both, as you are suggesting, uh, when we get to the discussion after hearing uh, uh, Shri Ayer, uh, why not India forms with their neighbors, uh, our neighbors, a, another body which uh, you know has uh, uh, relationships and an understanding with other democratic countries, uh, such as the Quad countries, uh, to deal with the the menace of dictatorship which uh, Xi Jinping uh, today represents. Now, um, you, are a, um, you have mentioned about Xi Jinping and you are, you are a good friend of uh, the values that Mr. Prime Narendra Modi stands for and you support him, you write. Could you explain how he couldn't figure out what Xi Jinping was uh, after 18 meetings with him? And that too, one to one, some of them extending for hours and hours. So after hearing uh, Sri Ayer, kindly answer these two questions. Should we not form a third poll and not be with either of the two, in, in, in favor of the democratic countries? Uh, one and two, why is it that we never figured out uh, Xi Jinping in 18 uh, times that you met him? Uh, what was the... Uh, why is it you didn't give him good advice or the others didn't give him good advice or, uh, or what was the reason we need to understand? We can't be taken for a ride again. Okay, over to you, uh, uh, Shri Ayer. Now it's all yours. You look like as if you're you you on lake. You look as if you're on lake. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, I'm actually in Kashmir Valley with a horse farm and their horses are freely grazing. Um, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be at uh, VHS uh, expressing my thoughts. And I just want to kind of uh, give you my read on these two groupings, Quad and, and BRICS. And, and let's start with BRICS. Um, the recent events sort of indicate that... Uh, Putin may not exactly be towing China's line. A couple of instances to show that. One is that uh, Putin has stopped selling aircraft engines. And uh, now you can say, hey, what is the big deal? China already has their own aircraft. But it is considered a big deal because some of these things can, uh, in the long run, have a detrimental effect. But for Putin to do that, means that he has a plan B in his pocket. The other thing is that Russia right now is sort of like doing something which is to best express, expressed as, you know, creating noise in one direction while they are trying to do something else. And, and this is to me still a puzzle why Russia is supporting Belarus, which in turn is allowing plane loads of people from Turkey to come there and then start, uh, you know, permeating into Western Europe. Now, this is what people are saying is they are doing all this noise creation there so that they can invade Ukraine. Why Ukraine? Russia wants to control the all the natural gas pipelines from Russia to the West, that is Europe, as well as to uh, to the Eastern Europe sector. But will they succeed in this? That is the point. And and in this. What is Russia's role in and BRICS? I'm not so sure that Russia is really keen on doing what Xi Jinping wants Putin to do. Otherwise, he would have not done that. And here is the other interesting thing. I, I've heard that in the last few visits, whenever Putin comes visiting China, the first person he visits is Jiang Zemin, not Xi Jinping. I mean, this is open, sir. I mean, so this is interesting stuff. Why is he thinking that it is Jiang Zemin who calls the shots even now? Up until Hu Jintao, yes. But Xi Jinping is, is a bit of a maverick in that respect. And the question now is, will the deep state in China 
uh, unseat Xi Jinping and, and put somebody else in, in power. If, if that happens, then the equation between Russia and China and perhaps US and China also might change. So we have to wait and see. So this is as far as my read of the BRICS is concerned. Everybody, you, both of you have captured the China's uh, the power position. However, in military terms, China has kind of rattled US, in my opinion, doing two things. One is that US's Connecticut submarine However, U.S. keeps saying that it hit an uncharted seamount, the amount of damage it has suffered, one. And the second is the fact that a Chinese submarine from the same area was found going through Taiwan Strait and it had to surface. So, so the, the, the big story that's you know being constructed, and I'm not sure yet if this is going to be accepted by both parties, is that Chinese submarine went and hit from the, from the bottom, the US, uh, USS Connecticut, which is electronically the most advanced nuclear submarine. Why? Because the USS Connecticut was sitting at the mouth of the Hainan Island where most of the Chinese nuclear submarines are parked. So this is, this is something that we have to see. But the problem there is USS, US has suffered some damage there. On top of that, China tested its hypersonic missile. And U.S. has come out. U.S. has come out and said, we have to play catch up in this. So the U.S. as a military power is now suddenly feeling that it has some catching up to do. Whether this happened in Biden's watch or in uh, Trump's watch, I can't say. But now China is showing that we've got a few cards up our sleeve too. Now, you, you go back to like the time when um, Biden came to power. Um, Trump was a rah-rah guy for Quad. He wanted Quad. He was very supportive of it. He had two plus two talks. And, and uh, the then Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, had come to India and he had promised a lot of things. I, I think U.S. gave uh, India some drones and other surveillance equipment so that the Galwan area, India, could have a better sighting of what China was up to. But when Biden came, we don't know what kind of a backroom deal was done, but clearly Biden had given a free pass to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, led by the uh, maverick person, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is not coming out, but you can see all the minions making a lot of noise. Now, what has happened is perhaps the progressive sector lobby has chewed more than what it can uh, 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 have written more than what they can chew. And now you have the most fundamental thing that would have helped most of America looking like it's going to fail. It's called Build Back Better. This is the infrastructure uh, package. And that is not going through. And so what I'm trying to say here is, while America looked like it was turning India away from Quad, in my opinion, it was the internal, uh, you know, uh, fights that were going on inside the Biden administration. We have to always remember that up to 44 people in the current Biden administration are Pak sympathizers, Pakistani sympathizers. We have three or four Indian uh, American uh, people also, but they want to be model American citizens. They, they, they don't want to say anything about India. And the one poor U.S. Uh, ambassador who came and visited uh, Mohan Bhagwaji in RSS headquarters in Nagpur got an earful from some, you know, nonsense uh, Democrat who probably can't even spell many of the Indian names. So the, the point here is... He was pushed out from his job also from the State Department, I think. <laughs> it's very, very sad. It's very sad when something like that happens. Clearly, you know, the Indian Americans have to find their voices. I, for one, am doing what I can to try and bring awareness. The most disappointing thing is the U.S. kind of took his eyes off the ball as far as China is concerned. And, and they were very focused on extracting their forces from Afghanistan. And I believe, and I, I don't know if you two gentlemen agree with me or not, I believe India missed a trick when U.S. came asking, look, we just want 10,000 or 5,000 of your troops guarding the city of Kabul. 
and we will do an orderly extract. And you guys, we will give you all the uh, weaponry. We'll give leave everything there. You are welcome to do it. We just want this to be done in an orderly way. I think United States are not tired of paying the government of Afghanistan, the workers, the banks, the military, for 20 long years, sir. 9-11 was 20 long, 20 years ago. This might have been one consideration that you said, what are we paying these people this money for? So at that point, India should have grabbed the, the opportunity with both hands. We have to look at history. Hannibal was not defeated in Rome. He was defeated in his own land. The Romans went back to where he lived, and that's where they defeated him. And, and here India is now facing the prospect of enhanced, probably uh, amplified terrorism from the very people that they could have kept under control if they had taken up on US's offer. Now, $80 billion worth of equipment, surely some of that, they'll, these guys will reverse engineer and use it against who? Against India. So, so right now, America is not very, you know, uh, well inclined towards India saying that, look, you guys promise something, then you go back on your promises. This is something that Mr. Modi has to answer. Did he say that he will pit, put uh, boots on the ground? Because when General McMaster's came asking for help, the then defense minister and the current finance minister made a statement as if she was an NDTV. No. Why, why would you do something like that? Why would a general come all the way from US if he had not already got indications that India was going to do that? I mean, this thing about 15% of India is Muslim. Afghanistan is also Muslim. 15% of India is Sunni. So is Afghanistan. I mean, this, this 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 kind of a backward thinking that happens in the Babudam, I, I can't imagine why India missed that trick. Now, India has going to spend, spend more money just staying in place because they have to fortify themselves. You also have the National Security Advisor saying that India needs to look internally for most of its trouble. And lo and behold, the CDS's helicopter has crashed. It's now two weeks since the black box was recovered. I don't expect anyone to say anything. Saying one way or the other way is going to hurt India, so they won't say anything. But the point is the morale. The morale of the Indian Army, the Indian Navy, and the Indian Air Force, I'm sure, has taken a beating. All, all I can say is, you know, for their sake, they need to find out what really went wrong there. So that's, that's where I think things stand now. However, should India ask America for help. I think America will come to India's help, but the price, the price will not be as reasonable as if India had helped uh, Afghanistan in uh, in Kabul. This is my limited uh, thing, and I also have some positive from uh, US. US has not uh, done any CATSA sanctions against India yet because it is my belief that US understands that there is other problems that it is not able to, able to solve, primarily to achieve military parity with China. Dr. Swami, there's a bigger problem for US. US may say, okay, fine, we will help you, provided you be the boots on the ground in fighting the Chinese. Maybe to take Tibet, I don't know, I'm just saying. But at that point, India should not back down. India needs to say yes, because we can't spend our uh, hard-earned tax dollars, middle, middle income uh, pay taxpayers' tax dollars on buying more equipment, laying roads that probably are not going to be inhabited much. So this is something that might happen. I'm hoping it will happen. We will try and do our best to make it happen. Thank you. Good. Uh, I think uh, we should ask reactions from my colleagues also. Um, Ramesh, uh, uh, what happened to Harvind uh, 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 Chaturvedi and uh, and um, um, uh, our uh, Jagdish Shetty? They are here. Let's hear from their uh, them. Uh, Ramesh, what do you have to say? Yeah, I just have one question. Uh, given that the new aggression that Russia has, uh, there is some feedback. Anyway, sorry. Given that Russia's aggression in Ukraine now and they're backing out. U.S. might be looking at sanctions. How would India, would India being a part of the Quad, support it or not? And what would be India's position? Uh, go ahead. Uh, on, on. Yeah, you know, uh, Ramesh, I want to tell you very clearly, as far as I know political science, hmm. in a democracy, you change a government through an election. 
Hmm. The the person, whatever be the merits or demerits of the particular person, hmm. uh, I would request you not to basically, uh, I, I mean, wholesale believe in what you are hearing uh, about Ukraine. The situation is you have a very strong Ukrainian nationalist uh, element in Ukraine. Okay. I say Ukrainian nationalists, they don't like Russian-speaking people. But about 40% of Ukraine is Russian-speaking. Yeah. They don't like that 40%. Let's say in India, East and West don't like each other, or North and South, fortunately, we don't have that situation at all. Dr. Swami is, I mean, all of us, frankly, we have lived um, uh, most of our lives in North India, and we have felt perfectly at home. And North Indians got come to the South, they feel at home. But the reality is, frankly, that this Ukrainian nationalism, what happened? Mm -hmm. Again, Ramesh, please don't get me wrong. Let me tell you very clearly. I am just looking at it in a dispassionate way. Mm -hmm. What did, I mean, you to say that the Americans were not, the Hillary Clinton in particular, she was very clearly trying to create what happened at the Maidan. You know, lakhs of people congregating, violence, bloodshed. Of course, the Ukrainian police, the Ukrainian security services, if you've got violence and bloodshed in any city in India or any city in the United States, well, uh, I, I certainly hope that you're going to have some counter uh, to that so that this violence and bloodshed ceases. Now, Yanukovych is a Russian-speaking president. He was Russian-speaking, but he was elected and he was removed from office through the power of the street. Now, once you legitimize the power of the street to remove a head of state or a head of government you are legitimizing anarchy so i'm sorry ramesh number one number two you're asking about russia well uh, according to the information i have and i am i mean as dr swami knows you know he and i have been in touch with friends in russia but quite very for decades if i may say so the next target after the successful Ukraine coup against President, elected President Yanukovych being toppled by street mobs was Putin in Russia. So the next mobs would have been in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Kharkov, various other cities in the, United, in, the, in, in the Russian Federation. Now, you know, you may believe that, for example, what happened to Mr. Gaddafi, uh, you may be a saintly person and say, yes, if I, even if I'm Gaddafi, I will forgive those who, who, who torture me. Putin, I don't think, is a very forgiving person. And when he realized that the next target was himself, after Yanukovych fell, the next person to fall would be himself. I think the iron entered his soul and he said, I am going to protect myself. And he did that by grabbing the Crimea and by strengthening the Russian-speaking people there. And may I say, Ramesh, that the native Ukrainian speakers treated the Russian-speaking people as second-class citizens. I would not even say second-class. I'd say 10th-class citizens. Now, let us say you are in the United States. You are from India. Uh, you're, uh, you know, I mean, you're not, I mean, uh, I say you are like Sri Aya. Now, supposing he's treated because he's coming from India, and he speaks Tamil as a as a tenth class citizen. Sri Ayer may not be very happy about that particular government in Washington. Fortunately, America is an open society despite everything, and everybody feels at home there. Certainly, when Lakshmi and I go there for visits, we feel very much at home there. We like the place, and and if I may if I may confess, we like the you know going to China as well, quite very frankly, and because we like the Chinese people, we like their culture. We're not very happy with Xi Jinping, but we like China and the Chinese people. But I'd like to say very, very clearly, there was a very good reason behind Putin taking hold of the Crimea. Because according to his information, they were going to join NATO. And then you'll have American troops and all kinds of other troops being stationed right on the Russian frontier. And that will severely degrade the Russian security. So that is why this happened. So I want to say, Ramesh, let us be honest with you. Let's look at the whole picture. Or, you know, the problem that we have is we look at something on a 90-degree lens or maybe a 180-degree lens. You have to look at everything through a 360-degree lens. 
And if you look at the Ukrainian issue from a 360 degree lens, this narrative that democracy won, Yanukovych was elected. Democracy won without election by street power. You had this Arab uh, Spring. I forecast in the very first days of the Arab Spring that watch out, this is going to become a Wahhabi winter. And, uh, and, the, and the Muslim Brotherhood, which is not even a Muslim organization, it's a Wahhabi organization, was very strongly strengthened by the so-called Arab Spring, another of Hillary Clinton's pet projects. Apart, So my request is very simple, Ramesh. Let's not you know, look at only one side of the picture. Now let's come back to the, to the court. I think the, the fear of Dr. Swami and, uh, and, uh, and Mr. Sri Iyer about the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, and I am quite clear that, yes, I do support him. I do believe he's a good Prime Minister. But I'd like to say very clearly, the fear is that India will be the odd man out in the court. That you'll have Japan, Australia, and the US on one side, India on the other. And on the surface, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence that goes to that. The latest, for example, was India rushing like a marathon runner. I mean, you know, you have this 100-yard dash and you had Roger Bannister, I think, breaking the record. I think India broke the record for being the first country to immediately say, no, we are definitely going to be in the Beijing Olympics. Definitely. 100%. Even the rest of the world says, no, we are going to be there. Of course, we may not get any medals. It's a different matter. But we will be there. And I'm sure that some VIP or the other, because, you know, the Chinese treat VIPs very well, they would have had a wonderful visit. I remember once Dr. Swami, myself, and, and, and Jagdish, and, and, and you know, we, we, we went, and Lakshmi, we all went uh, because uh, we wanted to see Mount Kailash. And, we are, I mean, Dr. Swami is a VIP, and uh, Jagdish and I are very insignificant persons, but we were all treated very well. So the reality of situation is, uh, is very, very clear. The point is, we, we in, what I have understood is that we are not the odd man out. There's a lot of activity going on behind the scenes to integrate India into the supply chain, integrate India into the defense infrastructure. But for some reason, this is something that is not being talked about loudly by the present government. Prime Minister Modi and uh, External Affairs Mr. Jay Shankar have never mentioned China's name. <laughs> the reason that is given is, quite frankly, that they don't want to go the wolf warrior way of China. They don't want the Chinese to have even the fig leaf to say that India is aggressive. So they don't they want to avoid that. So the entire world knows it is China that is aggressive. Now, you may not like that logic, but that is, in any case, it's an argument. It's a logic. And that is the reason why both have been silent about China. But I have reason to believe they have been very active on the US front, on the Japan front, and on the Australia front. And that is what I am, I, am, I am led to believe. I am outside government. I have to rely on information that comes to me, you know, and they may, may be right or not. I can't directly check up because I'm outside government. But the reality is that in my view, Prime Minister Modi fully understands that the security of India cannot be assured in the absence of a clear partnership with other like-minded countries. I'm not going to use the word democracies. Vietnam is a like-minded country. It's hardly a democracy. Some countries in the Middle East, I mean, Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman is not a democracy, but it's a like-minded country to India. Mohammed bin Salman has said the Tablighi Jamaat is a terror organization. We have not said that in India. In fact, we allowed the Tablighi Jamaat to have a huge jamboree, a huge gala. And of course, that uh, I mean, the, the chaps in that gala were blamed for the, for the Delta variant. I don't think they were responsible, frankly. The Delta variant was caused by various other issues. I'm not going to go into that now. But the fact is that the Saudis have said Tablighi Jamaat is a terror organization. You know, India has not. So that is a like-minded country in my point of view. It is against Wahhabism. And therefore, I'd like to say, Ramesh, I mean, a lot of the work in my, in my understanding is taking place. 
for some reason the prime minister is make, taking it on a very low key but i do not believe he is inactive and i do not believe he has any lack of understanding about the security challenges facing india now is russia a like minded country as far as brics is concerned i think it is well realized that the chinese have complete choke hold on brics but why as i said why why you know why make a big thing and leave it be there and because and wait for better times and hopefully if we have a a good set of policies a good matrix of policies and some of the holdovers that are still there in the government very frankly and some of the influences in the government that are still of the past i remember when prime minister modi took over and he formed his government i said publicly this is a 20% modi government 40% manmohan singh 40% bajpai well today it's about uh, 30% modi it's about uh, 40% uh, bajpai still and the balance is still manmohan singh so i'd like this government to be 100% modi i know that you know uh, somebody some people here are not going to like that but i would like it to be 100% modi it's still only 30% modi in the government led by modi and that is one reason why whatever happens in india any problem in india oh that's the fault of this guy called narendra modi well frankly whether you know even if you have you know even if you work 23 and a half hours uh, in a night in a day and a night you're not going to have the time to solve 1000 of the issues that are there on the table of the government and very frankly i'd like to say and, and nobody can do that so this uh, you know putting all the blame on this one individual i think is wrong if certain policies have not been good i think i have been very forthright about demonetization i have been very forthright about about uh, gst i have been very forthright about lockdowns but overall i'd like to say i believe the direction is positive and i and that is where I, in in my opinion i'm very happy to participate in a in a place where again you have brilliant minds like dr swami who also <laughs> give a very clear direction so i don't really like to say i make no apologies for not basically be, believing that the prime minister is responsible for all the problems in india or that he is not aware of the fact that you must have a military alliance the whole you cannot keep the indo pacific free open and inclusive without a show or use of military force it's not possible it's like saying you can live without oxygen or you can live without food and water you can't so the military is implied it is not explicit so whether it should be explicit or not is a matter of debate i believe it should be much more explicit than it is i am very unhappy that we jumped and said we are going to the beijing olympics so i have said all right if you want to go send kiran rijuju he's a he's a very <laughs> you know, uh, uh, dynamic uh, uh, and younger minister send kiran rijuju and, and, and he's from arunachal also <laughs> i'm sorry he is also from arunachal well arunachal is an indian state dr swami i, I know let like the chinese realize that no no so, some so, scholars so, in india say oh we believe in one china policy then <laughs> obviously they don't believe arunachal and ladakh uh, or sikkim are part of india oh, i'm sorry yeah. all three are yeah okay uh, thanks very much um, um, uh, narapat <laughs> you have a clear point of view and uh, this is a democratic uh, a forum and you can certainly speak in favor of modi if you want um and we are none of us is going to object to being a democratic forum uh what about arvind and uh, uh yeah yeah and, uh, <coughs> jagdish thank you yeah. thank you I, I, in fact uh, I, i would begin with uh, what has been said earlier uh, dr swami started with the history of formation of brics and quad he said brics was formed in 2006 and quad in 2007 the very reason that quad was formed after one year of brics that was basically to counter the impact of brics but let me just tell you one thing in fact uh, overall this is first time that i'm hearing uh, uh, professor monu nalapat talk about uh, a balancing position despite of favoring uh, uh, prime minister narendra modi uh, he said uh, we have a lot of hope from quad but we let's hang on and remain in uh, brics with the hope for a better future but let me just tell you 
what has quad discussed in so many years whatever meetings of quad that that india has participated in they have talked about security and stability climate change corona vaccination environment sustainability terrorism space technology and telecom 5g and other things not one quad meeting has discussed economic situation which will benefit india either in terms of trade imports or in terms of export now look at the other hand dr sami said india and china to, i mean if bricks together uh, form 40 41% of the uh, global population of course 36 37% comes from india and china alone and 24% of gdp comes from india and china alone now look at the india china trade we have been talking about Uh, professor Nal- nalapat's favorite prime minister mr narendra modi has been talking about atmanirbharta make in india and so on other things tiktok boycott ban on chinese apps 60 odd uh, chinese applications in uh, 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 mobile phones were banned uh, in the name of atmanirbharta and make in india whatever 100 billion dollar we have touched in terms of trade in fact we have crossed 100 billion dollars and our dependence on china look at that 70% of our import of or use of uh, smartphones comes from china it 70% of the medicine bulk drugs i have been talking about this in so many different programs uh, api bulk, bulk drugs 70% of the bulk drugs come from china automobile components come from china telecom components come from china average chinese contribution in india's import is more than 20% can we afford to boycott china now of course uh, uh, dr swami has been advocating supporting uh, quad and by saying that whether it is brics or whether it is sco sco that is shanghai uh, cooperation uh, russia and china they are the common members with india in these two organization brics and uh, uh, sco but at least the brics part do chinese dominate i mean uh, professor nalpat all along uh, he, he has been saying that china dominates and now when uh, dr swami says that russia is a junior partner and if china yeah. and russia come together what is india's role india's role is insignificant india's voice cannot be heard either in brics or sco but when we look at the trade when we look at the statistics we find can india afford to boycott chinese trade these are statistics which i have just now mentioned i mean the, the india's economy to a large extent we are not yet prepared to that extent that we ignore uh, china in fact uh, we all know that uh, the, the not only very formation of quad but even the, whether it was trump administration or whether it is joe biden administration they have been trying to you know uh, 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 pin prick china on one way or the other recently uh joe biden appointed a coordinator for uh, tibet and uh, the, of course trump also had appointed a similar coordinator but china does not take notice of this it doesn't matter so i'm saying this pin prick between china and uh, us will continue let us look at our interest let us look at our economic interest our economic interest suggests us that we cannot afford to boycott china either in favor of quad or in favor of any other organization i would like dr swami and professor nalapat and this mr shriya here to comment on what i've just now said thank you okay let's hear jagdish first and then we'll come back to the comments jagdish my question is a lot of questions here on our chat box and all that well, what is this why are india part of two organizations why can't we Uh, be either here or there i mean the, that is the the common man wants to know i want to know from both professor nalapatri ayer and even dr swami then what is the advantage either you be with bricks or be with quad can't we have either this or that because uh, and uh, arvin chatrapati is saying that uh, he is saying all those figures and all that is fine but officially government is saying boycott this app boycott that app and all that it is is it not contradictory if we cannot then we should not be even boycotting that the government should not be even boycotting that 
one of our viewers is just now said it in our chat saying that no these boycotts are only for the common man the government does all these deals at higher level the boycott is only for the common man the chinese uh, goods of chinese app so i want uh, to understand why can't we be either this side or that side why on both yes professor nalapath can you tell us about it what is this why are we part of both well uh who like uh, shri ayer so we are saying you are to leave i am to leave okay um uh, do you want me to answer this question all right yes start you, with you answer. answer yes yeah yes so dr swami's uh, panchatantra example of panchatantra bat has really hit home <laughs> people have come down to the basics uh, here's what i would have done or i would have liked to do is see how is china become so powerful they pick their nmb to some artificial number and they just kept printing currency note notes after note notes after note notes after note it is believed that they print three times the gdp of their uh, that annual gdp is printed as notes all in the name of building infrastructure now if the west did not penalize uh, china why isn't india doing this stuff if india want to replace china and become atmanirbhar why isn't india saying we are going to peg our currency at this for 5 years this will make things easier i don't mind if it makes it 75 today is only 73 74 make it 75 but you say for 5 years this is going to be the same people need that stability so that they can start planning long term i mean we've been talking for close to 8 9 months now about bringing a semiconductor fab in india and and i'm already seeing four other places now you know trying to do the same thing we can't take this long you have to do it fast mr modi did this thing overnight remember singur he got the entire tata plant to move from one corner of the country to the exact opposite he did this i'm looking for that modi this is how i this is how i see it yeah well you know let me add to this let's look at china itself between 1971 when kissinger turned up in beijing in one of those famous secret visits and the thaw began china was a pussy cat as far as china, united states is concerned the best example is in wto the americans laid down these are the things that you have to agree to only then we will make you a member of wto and they signed every one of them and throughout the period if you see up to say 5 uh, years ago 6 years ago the chinese have always sided with the united states in the united nations in the security council in trade matters and so on and what did the americans do for them they said you and don't have any industry the cultural revolution has ruined it all and mao said to them made it worse so what we will do for you is that we will tell east asian countries don't export directly to the united states so export your semi processed goods not processed goods to to china china will then do the uh, final uh, this take for example the uh, computer the the circuits come from taiwan they put the keyboard the screen the the the, the cover and write lenovo made in china almost everything that china produced in the beginning up to say the year 2002 2003 was semi processed goods coming from east asia coming to china and then value added and exported at a much higher price uh, to the west that's it. so they were in deficit with east asia in uh, balance of trade and they were in huge surplus in, in uh, with with the west and europe that's how china grew so therefore um, uh, what i am saying today to you is we have a security problem the chinese are here they have crossed what they have sworn to obey 
namely uh, or honor, and that is the LAC. And the LAC in Arunachal was, of course, the MacMoon line, and uh, the LAC for uh, for Kashmir, uh, Ladakh, uh, was uh, was specifically drawn by uh, Jiang Xing, uh, the, 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 the military man who was then uh, the uh, the president, and came. Uh, and they uh, that has been violated. They have crossed it, come across. Now, what, what is the difficulty in say, saying that the, this has happened? What is the great uh, diplomacy that we are uh, following? In fact, we are discrediting ourselves. The public has come to know. Military men who have suffered injuries, have they have come and said. People who lost uh, their uh, loved ones in uh, Galwan, they have come and said. So, you know, the, the word is now widespread in India that the Chinese have come and occupied our territory despite Modi meeting 18 times Xi Jinping and five times going to China uh, on uh, visits uh, for uh, big conferences. So, where have, where has the, who has made the fool of us? The, it's obviously the Chinese who have. And uh, not one country is willing to uh, explicitly condemn China for this. So you have no friends and uh, because everybody is your friend. So I'm saying time has come to choose. The Americans are only good for giving you weapons. Uh, tell the Americans we will take care of China, but we need weapons. And I'm sure that the, that is what you will get. That is what you want and that's what you will get. They have much better weapons than what you're getting from Russia. Russia may not put in maybe an independent personality, but he is so heavily in debt to China after the uh, sanctions imposed by the United States that I don't think he can wriggle out of obeying China. Is there not a single decision he has taken in uh, multilateral matters in the, in the world where he has gone against China? Even in our discussion with us, he has uh, he has uh, 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 taken the same line with the Chinese stake on everything else. In fact, the last visit of Putin came for one day only. He said to uh, to uh, to Modi, which I have learned from sources, that the Chinese will not go back. And so, what you need to do is draw a new LAC and not make an issue of that. That is what the advice he gave to Modi. And uh, after all this, if you go to Beijing um, um, Winter Games and also go for a trilateral meeting uh, with the I'm afraid you will lose all credibility all over the world. Yes, um, Ramesh, do you want to say something? You know, so no, sir, I'm good. May I just cut Come in on, uh, on Ramesh? Uh, Ramesh, you're talking about, uh, I think, uh, Joe Biden. I think Sri was mentioning about Joe Biden, and he was not very happy with Mr. Biden. Well, let me say that Biden ran away from Afghanistan. And frankly, he made a mess of things. And I think that was on the advice of, as you correctly said, the, the group that we are talking about, the, the, the Pakistan group. He is very, very strong in the Pentagon, State, White House, etc. No doubt about it. It's not only with Bernie Sanders. It's been there for, as a part of the American system for decades, uh, for several decades. You know that. So they're including some important people from California. So the reality is that the Biden to it was told by this lobby that you will be such a popular president. You will be able to withdraw from Afghanistan. You won't have any casualties. Americans are fed up of this never-ending war. And instead of which Biden has become a, a figure of fun, an object of ridicule, because the way he ran away from Afghanistan and the entire credibility of the United States with Biden as commander-in-chief took a knock. So the good news is Biden now understands that following the dictates of that particular lobby is going to send him into a political pit and the De Democratic Party into complete collapse in the 2022 midterms. Forget the 2024 presidential election. So that's a good inoculation, if I may say so. A good antidote uh, has been administered by his mistake in Afghanistan 
which was caused by the advice of this particular lobby that Sri has very correctly pointed out. But I, so, uh, so far as India is concerned, I think Biden is very clear. Now, you know, let me be frank with you. you know, uh, Arvind was talking in terms of, you know, the trade with China, etc. You know, Arvind, the fact is that when you are in hopelessly in debt, now one thing you can do is to try and get some bank which doesn't know your debt status to give you some more credit cards so you can go even more into debt. Or the same bank will give you one more credit card and finally take over your house and all the property inside it. I'm not very sure that would be very good. The reality is today we have a golden opportunity an even bigger opportunity than China had in the 1980s and which China took full advantage of. We have got a bigger opportunity now. There's a huge decoupling taking place from China. Tech companies in particular cannot locate in China and in three or four years, they will not be able to sell their equipment except to China, to Russia, to Pakistan. Of course, Pakistan is a great big market. So selling to Pakistan, I'm sure all American companies would love to sell to Pakistan. Uh, I mean, if, if their CEOs are, are not entirely the best to have. But I'd just like to point out, in this situation, India is the ideal alternative. But for that, our signaling has got to be right. Wow. One problem that I'm that we are, I'm seeing with every government, including this government, is the implicit belief that it's only officials talking to each other and the ruling structures talking to each other. Presidents to presidents, prime ministers to prime ministers, secretaries to secretaries. I mean, secretary, undersecretary in the US case, secretary is a cabinet minister. And, you know, uh, head of government to head of government. Sorry, in a democracy, it's everybody. And if you don't give proper signaling so that everybody across the world understand the signaling, well, you may be able to give any kind of signaling head to, to the government, head of government, to the uh, officials, to the politicians. And at the end of it, the public is going to say, we don't want this country. We don't want to be a partner of this country. So that is where I'd like to say it's very important that the Modi government have an all of society signaling and they involve civil society also in that signaling. Now, if we are not make it completely, if I may say so, government to government signaling and a lot of that signaling is, is you know, under the iceberg. It's under the water line. If it's under the water line, people don't know it. We can't appreciate it. And they don't believe it's real. And then one day there will be a consequence of that. It is, you know, for, for some time you can keep going on the basis that there is no alternative. Frankly, the biggest favor that was done to the BJP was when Rahul Gandhi was declared by the Congress party to be the prime ministerial candidate. <laughs> I think the BJP will be praying that Rahul Gandhi will again be declared by the Congress party as a prime ministerial candidate. I think that would be, frankly, give the BJP uh, several points, uh, I mean, advantage over any other party. But the reality is that your, your signaling has got to be people to people in a democracy. It's only government to government. And most of it is secret. And as a consequence, across not only the world, I've been hearing this now for about three, four years, pretty nasty comments all over the world. At least about three years, uh, I mean, even, uh, no, not four years, about three years. And now I'm hearing it in India over the last two years. Uh, and especially in the last six months or so, a lot of very negative comments are coming about the government, in my view, substantially, because they don't know what the government is doing. But that's not something that is something that is a good thing. Government has got to understand that. And frankly, if our signaling is wrong, the benefit that court can offer of India being integrated into a security and economic structure, the way China integrated itself in the 1980s, India can integrate itself via the court in this century. But it will not happen unless the signaling is right. And I must confess, I agree the signaling is not right so far. But I must end by saying I still have confidence that Prime Minister Modi 
will ensure a proper signaling in the next year or so. And so that 2022 becomes India's year for the decoupling to be coming to India in a massive way. We're running, we are running out of time. Uh, anybody wants to make a short comment? No, Dr. Swami, it won't be short. So. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, we already 9:25. Yeah, no, no, I don't want to do it. Let's let's do it. It's okay. We'll take it for another. Arvind, day. you may kindly wind up. Thank you. Uh, the, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to have uh, Professor Nalapat and Shri here with this program. Dr. Swami is uh, part of the host team also in the in a way, and uh, Dr. Swami initiates the discussion and raises the point which he did today. And it was such an enlightening discussion. And I'm sure our uh, viewers will also be happy and uh, benefited by this discussion. Uh, uh, it's, maybe we are touching almost about 90 minutes. But you see, these topics uh, see no end, actually, in discussion. And there are so many issues involved, entangled in one and another. that It is very difficult to conclude and develop some kind of consensus. Consensus is not the idea of this kind of program. This kind of program is basically to... Uh, uh, provoke people to think and uh, come to a conclusion. I mean, there are many issues and uh, experts only give advice, their opinion, and it is not necessary that all the opinions should uh, con converge on one point. Maybe, thank you, Dr. Swami. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sri Ayer, uh, Professor Nalapat, for such a, a, a wonderful discussion today. And maybe we'll continue uh, this topic uh, some other time. Last uh, Last week, we had a discussion on China, and uh, even that discussion went into about 90 minutes. But only thing is uh, inconclusive. So maybe a, a global issue and geopolitics, these are the issues which never end. And therefore, we'll continue. We'll meet some other day. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be meeting again at 8 o'clock. Thanks, Jagdish Shettiji. Thank you, Ramesh Swami. Thanks, the technical team led by Ashish. Tejas, uh, Gadgi Rakesh, Ishwar Ayer, Vishal Mehta, Ajay Shair. Uh, and Swaminathan. Uh, we'll be meeting next Sunday again, 8 p.m. Words of Wisdom, Gyan Ganga, with a new topic, Dr. Subramanian Swami, and a new guest, a new topic. Thank you very much. We'll be meeting next Sunday. Till then, Namaskar, Jain.